Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, lawmakers who are also medical professionals, one doctor and one nurse, talk about the increase in unvaccinated children and what the state can do to prevent vaccine-preventable illnesses. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. In 2000, the United States declared that measles had been eradicated. Now headlines of measles outbreaks are occurring across the country at an alarming rate. Joining me to talk about preventing outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases in Minnesota is Senator Scott Jensen. Thanks for being here. Hi Shannon, it's nice to be here, thank you. The World Health Organization listed vaccine hesitancy or the delay in acceptance of or refusal to be vaccinated as one of the top 10 health threats for 2019. Do you agree with this assessment? Yes, I do. I think that vaccination is a powerful tool uh, to prevent disease. I think I would probably put uh, maintaining clean water as another one of those top 10. But I think generally the World Health Organization is going to look at public health measures it can do. So yeah, I think, I think having vaccines uh, as done as broadly and as robustly as possible is, is a critical thing. So to what extent do you attribute, to what do you attribute the change in attitude about vaccination and to what extent, if any, do you agree with the anti-vaccination movement that has a fair, fair following right now in this country? Well. I think it's probably a, it's a big question you're asking. I would say that in a lot of ways it's doctors and the healthcare field's fault. We're not as credible as we used to be. We jump on the bandwagon uh, with alarming casualness. We talk about fake news in politics, but we've been doing fake news in medicine for a long time. If you meaning, think, if you think what, about, yeah. well, Take an aspirin every day, it'll prevent your heart attack. Whoops, better not take an aspirin, it'll cause a bleeding ulcer before it prevents a heart attack. Take B12, it's good for everything. Take mega doses of vitamin C, whoops, don't do that, you'll get a, mega, you'll get a vitamin eggs. C kidney don't stone. Eat eggs. Eat eggs, eat don't eggs, eat eggs, don't eat eggs. Vitamin D, oh, sunshine, oh, you better have some, oh, maybe not. Cholesterol, no, oh, lower your cholesterol, whoops, don't lower your cholesterol, it's just the LDL, whoops, it's not just the LDL, it's a ratio. We've got so many things, two weeks ago, uh, one of the cardiovascular groups came out and said that if women lower their LDL cholesterol, which is the bad component, down to less than 70%, they have a higher risk of stroke. So I think we've compromised our own credibility. And I think parents are thoughtful and they're responding to that. I could ask you a question and say, for the group of people over the age of 50, this last year, between 50 and 64 that got flu shots, what was the the effectiveness level, what percentage of efficacy did that vaccine, that flu vaccine have? What would your guess be? Uh, last year, I don't think the vaccine was very effective at all, if memory serves. Yeah, and this year it was 8%. People with asthma, a clear indication to get a flu shot, less than half of eligible people get them. And it's because of they're not buying what we're selling. So, so for you're me, putting blame on our medical institutions and our physicians in part because their message is not clear enough. So if you would talk to me a little bit about herd immunity because that's what we need for some of these vaccine preventable, preventable uh, Herd immunity is another one of those remarkably and outrageously exaggerated things by, by medicine. Herd immunity comes from my wife's field. My wife's a veterinarian. That's where it came from. If you can vaccinate 90% of your cows, you probably are gonna have herd immunity at the level where the entire herd will be covered. In, in human medicine, it isn't that simple. Even the people that are the biggest proponents of vaccination, mandatory vaccination, without parents having a right, will acknowledge that herd immunity for people that have had the, the measles shot, it wears off. 25 years and generally the immunity that you got, the immunogenicity of the vaccine may well be gone. The fact of the matter is you and I, if we're both over the age of 40, we may well have no particular immunity at all to measles any longer. So the idea that 95% of the American population is right now immune to the measles because of vaccination is not true. Herd immunity is a very difficult thing to get at, and most of the stuff that comes out about that, 
is basically from the statisticians. They'll look at this and they'll say, well, with this disease, because of the rate at which it spreads, we have to have 93% vaccination rate. This one, we have to have 87%. But we really don't know with what frequency we get the kind of immune response that we want. The science isn't good enough. And I'll give you one more example right here. Dengvaxia, D-E-N-G-V-A-X-I-A, recently in the news, just released by the FDA in America to approve a vaccine for dengue fever. Mm -hmm. If you read about that, and you read about the million kids that were vaccinated in the Philippines in accordance with data that's already old. In other words, they were giving it to a bunch of fourth graders in the Philippines without realizing that they shouldn't be giving it unless you've already had an episode of dengue fever. Because dengue fever basically develops into, if you will, a hemorrhagic uh, fever on the second time if it's going to occur. Your second exposure is a problem, your first one's not. Well, we went out and gave the first exposure to a bunch of kids in the Philippines, and we shouldn't have done that. Six out of seven, excuse me, six out of 13 people voted against that vaccine. Seven out of 13 voted, so they went with it. This isn't clear cut. So what you're saying is that mass vaccination for some of these illnesses that have caused severe harm in the past is not necessarily the right way to go? Exactly. We should do education. And that's why I put a, an amendment on a bill last week. My next question. I said, listen, let's try to find the common ground. And who did I go to talk about this? I went to Senator Eaton. And I said, Senator, would you, would you work with me on this? Because what I want to do is I want physicians to do a better job of reporting vaccine adverse effects because we don't always do that. I want us to do a better job of going out into the pockets in the communities and getting information to those folks in a context that they understand in their own language, in the written word, in their own language, rather than try to bully them or tell them you'll do this or else. Parents deserve to have rights. And I think that we should use education as a tool. My kids are fully vaccinated, but it wasn't because anybody told me I had to. It's because I wanted to. And my grandchildren are fully vaccinated, but that doesn't mean that parents shouldn't have the right to choose. What about though, for because vaccination started at a certain age, so children under say 15 months cannot be vaccinated. So they therefore can be exposed if the older people around them, if their caregivers and their siblings are not vaccinated. What about the threat to the very youngest in our society? Well, that, there's truth to that. I mean, that gets at that heart of the herd immunity piece. But the fact of the matter is, even if we got to 98% vaccine rate, and I know we're less than that, but if we got to 98%, we would still have far less herd immunity than I think the scientists would tell us. I think that we've compromised our believability and we're paying the consequence for it. One last question for you. You mentioned Senator Chris Eaton, a DFL. Uh, Senator, she introduced a bill that did not get a hearing that would remove the conscientious or philosophical objection, which is in current law for parents to be able to not vaccinate their children. It would remove it as a reason for not vaccinating. I believe California did in 2015. What is your stance on that? When we give someone a shot of penicillin, we're looking for that penicillin to do one thing, to go in and kill the bacteria in the bloodstream. When we give someone a shot of chemotherapy, we're not looking for one thing. We're looking for an immune response that's elegant and challenging in its nature. That's no different than what we're looking for when we give a vaccine. We are not looking for something to go in and kill something in the bloodstream. We're looking to provoke a response in our immune system full of neutrophils and lymphocytes and monocytes. It's a specific response we want. This is a big deal. When we start injecting five antigens at one time into a two month old, we're asking a lot of their immune system. No other country in the world injects so many antigenic vaccine stimuli in the first year as the United States. So when we do that, we're doing a big thing and it's nothing to sneeze at. Sounds like much more robust discussion is needed on this topic. Senator Jensen, I wanna thank you. Thank you. In conference committee this week, the provision to create a grant program to address vaccine preventable illnesses sparked more discussion about vaccination. This bill is trying to say, let's not call people names. Let's just go ahead and try to provide some dollars for education. Let's go to the communities where we're seeing the lowest rate of vaccinations and let's talk to them in their language 
at their level, wherever they're at. And that's what this is trying to do. And it also pushes physicians. Report it when you see a vaccine adverse reaction because physicians don't do that because in a busy day, they oftentimes will see a fever of 103 related to a vaccine. They don't report it. On average, in total, we do a good job on vaccination, but we do have some, uh, to me, pretty shocking uh, variations in, in rates of vaccination around our state. And we need to make sure that folks uh, are getting all the information that they need to make informed uh, decisions. So we're looking at doing culturally specific outreach, particularly to some of the communities that we've identified as having lower um, immunization coverage. What we found is that's very um, labor intensive. It's very much uh, peer to peer, parent to parent, one on one conversations. And so to be able to um, really scale that up, it does get to be costly. And so if, if the legislature feels it's valuable, we would appreciate if there were resources that were invested to allow us to help with some of this um, community specific outreach. Probably, you know, 65,000 kids are getting vaccinated every single year with the measles vaccine and have been doing so for the last um, 50, I hate to admit this, but 55 years. Um, and so, I mean, these are vaccines that have been used for generations, having acknowledged, you know, the fact that vaccines are not 100% effective, we know that they're exceedingly safe and we wouldn't be recommending them if that wasn't the case. I believe part of the problem is the underreporting of the adverse effects, of adverse effects. And when you use terms like exceedingly safe, um, I believe, Ms. Erisman, you believe that. And I believe the data shows that. But I believe the data you're relying on is extremely underreported. Some use a number 1% or less of the side effects, adverse reactions are reported, and which puts individuals like you with your professional character and ability at a real disadvantage. Almost 2,000 people came to the Capitol a month ago or so, and the average individual that was there did not want to be at the Capitol. They don't know, they didn't want to think about vaccines. They just obediently went and did what their doctor said with an exceedingly safe vaccine and just to only discover at some point, not very far after that, their child became nonverbal. Their child had encephalopathy. Their child developed something that they had no idea would happen. And, and so if you do the numbers, like one in a million or all that, we have a pretty big state to have that many millions of people to handle that, that incidence rate, and it's simply not possible. Uh, some of the people at that audience were people who vaccinated their second child because the doctor said, oh, that, 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 that effect couldn't have come from the vaccine. Oh, okay, do another one. Now you have two children who were damaged and just ran, whoa, surprise, and they thought, I'm not doing my third and fourth kid. They go to rallies like that because they feel disbelieved and they feel like nobody will listen to them. According to a National Public Radio report this week, nearly a dozen states are considering tightening laws relating to vaccines. Joining me to offer her perspective on proposed legislation in Minnesota is Senator Chris Eaton. Welcome. Thank you. Before we get to what did pass the Senate, let's start with one of the bills that you introduced this session that would re remove the conscientious objection uh, from parents. Right now they can conscientiously object to having their children vaccinated. It would remove that qualifier. What's the why is this important? Well, I think, you know, you talk about the herd immunity, uh, the protection that everybody being immunized gives to people who have uh, a suppressed immune system, who are getting treatment for cancer, or have another, um, you know, catastrophic disease that's messed with their immune system. And, you know, babies under six months can't be immunized, and they're very vulnerable. And then a lot of people who are over 60 who either had the disease or were uh, immunized when they were younger are probably not that protected anymore. So it puts a lot of the elderly at risk. So um, in the concerns for public health, that's, that's uh, my motivation for that. Um, also I think the uh, disease is much more dangerous than the vaccine. Um, I would not never say that there's no side effects to the vaccine. But I think it's um, 
been grossly overplayed. I don't think that any of the uh, side effects are anywhere near the um, uh, one in a thousand kids with uh, measles who get encephalitis a form that you get with measles that's untreatable. You die. So um, we had over 100,000 um, kids in the, uh, in the world, basically, with measles, die of, of measles last year. So it's, it's not a minor disease, I know. When I was a kid, we had measles parties, but that's well, because it wasn't Well, and I had chicken pox parties, yep. and now there's a chicken pox vaccine. But it's, it's true to say that there are more people who are conscientiously objecting than there used to be, and that is the impetus for the need for this bill, is that correct? Right, there was a false report by a doctor who did a fake study that's been discredited, but um, it got a lot of play on the internet and social media, and a lot of people believe it. And also when the ages that children get vaccinated are also the ages when a lot of uh, problems show up. When you first notice somebody might be have autism, when you first notice that somebody might not de be developing like they should, or when um, a seizure disorder shows up and all of that. So a lot of that um, coincidental things get attributed to the vaccines that probably had nothing to do with them. Well, let's turn now to what did pass. There was an amendment that Senator Scott Jensen offered. This was also your bill, and it was successfully added to the Omnibus Health and Human Services bill that would create a grant program to address vaccine preventable diseases. Is, is this a good, at least, first step? It is. I think we need to do some education in the community, and I think we need to make it less um, scary. I mean, the, if we could even separate out, I've talked to um, S Senator Dr. Jensen about separating out the different um, immunizations, you know, instead of having the MMR, you know, if we could just have the measles and not, you know, mumps and rubella are not as common. And if right. we could just do a measles vaccine that um, it might be less threatening to some people because that really is the more dangerous of the three. And um, so I think it's a good start. There is a companion in the House that I believe passed. So. so potentially at least grant programs for the future. Senator Jensen is also a guest this week. And I asked him about to speculate on, on why people's perceptions of vaccines have changed. He puts some blame on that medical establishment itself because of the steady stream of contradictory information about a number of things, you know, cholesterol or eggs or any number of things. Do you agree that our medical institutions and professionals bear a little bit of the blame for the misinformation that's coming out? I think it's a combination of things. Um, it's also uh, the sensationalizing of it by the press. When a study comes out and says, you can drink wine and it'll keep you from having a heart attack or whatever, um, you know, so, and then the next day, no alcohol will actually hurt your health, you know. I mean, those things are, uh, make for good headlines. And, uh, you know, and, I, and studies, you know, none of those have been backed up. You know, they haven't done the double blind or any of the scientific um, repetition that you need to do to prove that that study was actually ha any validity. So, um, part of the, so I think that's a big piece of it. So in a way, yes, he's correct. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's the medical community that are coming out with these things. It's just those studies, they get published in the medical journals and then the press picks up on them and they put them out as fact. People don't understand the scientific process or the scientific method that all these are is one study showed this. You know, nobody's right. repeated it yet. Nobody validated that study. There's also a philosophical point that's been raised. The public radio report I mentioned in my introduction quoted an Oregon woman who's considering leaving the Democratic Party over this issue, though it's not necessarily a partisan issue. But she said, quote, the Democratic view has always been about choice. My body, my choice. Choice in medical care for my child is no different. So what do you say to those who think that vaccinations are part of the pharmaceutical profit making and an overreach by government? Um, well, I certainly see their point. I, I believe that people should have a choice of what they do with their children. But there's also public health. If we had a um, black plague outbreak, we'd be locking people in their homes and not allowing them to leave. 
I mean, that's how public health works, is we protect the public from each other when those type of things help happen. I ha I'm a little, after talking to a lot of them, I'm a little less comfortable with forcing the immunizations than I initially was, but I still am concerned that a lot of the people have been so convinced of the danger of the immunizations beyond what is reasonable or scientific that they're putting their children at danger. My concern is the children. I don't, I don't really, um, I never even occurred to me about the parents' right issue. It's, I want children to not die from measles and there's no reason for it. We have the vaccine. Um, before the vaccine, the, our cemeteries were full of children dying from these childhood diseases. And we haven't had that and we don't need it now, but it's and the happening. Public and the public memory of those things is past. You know, it was generations before with polio and, and smallpox. And so we don't, our memory as a society has shortened. While I've got you here, I want to ask you one more question. You are on the uh, conference committee to deal with opioid abuse and prevention. Can you give us a brief update as to how that's going? Well, it's not moving as quickly as I'd like. Um, we've done a lot of um, uh, testifying or taking testimony. Um, we have, I mean, to start out with, both bills were so different. The only thing in common was they both raised $20 million and they both had an advisory council. But everything else was different, how the money was raised, who was on the council, and so on. And the Senate bill has a sunset that the House bill doesn't. So um, those are all points of contention right now. And uh, I would say that most of it will be pretty easy to overcome. We're, um, Probably the struggle is going to be around the sunset, but um, I still see a path for agreement, and I'm still hopeful. Less than two weeks to go, and you're still hopeful. I am. Senator Chris Eaton, thank you so much. You're welcome. In our occasional series, The People's House, historian Brian Pease talks about the Civil War battle flags on display in the Capitol. Minnesota began a tradition of displaying battle flags after the Battle of Bull Run in 1861. And there was a huge public ceremony in 1905 to bring the battle flags that were in the collection from the old Capitol to the new Capitol in 1905. What have these flags been doing since then? Well, that's an important part of Minnesota's history in recognizing the Minnesota men's involvement in the Civil War. So by virtue of putting the first battle flag on display in the first capital, you set that tradition and that sense of honor and pride to display those flags that these men were dying under uh, as a part of that tradition in Minnesota. So when those uh, old veterans back in 1905 were coming with their flags tightly wrapped around the flagstaff up to this brand new capital, this was a, a great sense of pride and honor because thousands of people came out in this parade to watch, probably for a lot of these men, the last time they ever marched under their flag. The flags were housed in these display cases, all wound up in tatters. And then in the 60s, they, there was an effort to unfurl them so that you could see them more in, as they would have been on the battlefield. What was the story behind that? Yeah, what was happening, you know, you're getting to the centennial of the Civil War in the 1960s. And so if you were to walk by these cases in the 1960s, you would have seen pieces of the flag on the, on the floor in the case. So they were deteriorating. And it didn't help that they were tightly wrapped around those flag staffs. And so in 1963 and 1964, uh, Tom Welter from St. Paul was hired to conserve the flags. And so he was very innovative. Uh, there weren't a lot of people in the United States conserving flags at that time, so he took it upon himself to design a special sewing machine that would put zigzag stitching so you can encapsulate the original silk in between silk crepeline and then keep all the pieces together, and then you could hang it from a flag staff unfurled so you could start seeing elements of those flags once again revealed. So you could really see the flag hanging on the pole. But at some point, 2009, I think, they came to look as they look now. What's the story behind that? What we were doing is we were always looking at the flags, and we could see where the zigs and the zags were taking place in the, those unfurled flags. You had more separation taking place of the fabric, and that kept all the pieces together, but gravity was really taking a toll. 
they had been on, on display for, for decades. And so you were seeing fading patterns in the kind of the top of the flag. So we really wanted to make sure we preserve these very important artifacts of Minnesota's history. So the Minnesota Historical Society took the lead in conserving the flags, taking them off those flag staffs or the flag poles, and then mounting them flat on a specially designed panels. So now we can have those flags on display flat. And, and we I mentioned before, some of those flags had never been seen unfurled before. Well, for probably 150 years, some of these flags had never been seen flat before. How many flags are in the collection and how often do they rotate? Yeah, there's uh, 59 uh, that are part of this collection. There's others that are part of the Minnesota Historical Society collection. And, and we rotate in, over time, 48 different flags. Some of the flags that are part of the collection are just very small remnants. So there's not really a lot to see and we want to protect those, those uh, historic relics. Just keep them under, under darkness as much as possible. So uh, every eight to nine months, we have four new flags that we rotate in. We try to uh, equal the number of regimental flags and national colors. And of the four display cases here too, we do have a flag case for the Spanish-American War because those flags were also transferred to this brand new capital in 1905. I read that some of the bravest men in the Civil War were those that carried the colors. They marched six paces in front of their regiment and were basically the steering wheel for their men. Yeah, it was, uh, for those color bearers, that was a sense of pride and honor because they were selected among the regiment. They were some of the most popular, the most physical, the most respected men. Because you're carrying those flags for a purpose and that's to protect those flags and to make, make them very visible during campaigns or battles as you're marching into battle or in battle. And so to carry that color, not only were you helping control the direction of the unit as it's going into battle or retreating out of battle, but you also put yourself as a big target because each side was trying to shoot down those color bearers because they were, once again, a communication device. And so for those men fighting around those flags, that's representing their nation. That's what they're fighting for, preserving the Union. Or they're fighting with their regimental color, their state color, fighting for their home, fighting for what they believe is an important part of that, their participation in the Civil War. Do you have a favorite flag? Well, the one behind us is the flag from the 4th Minnesota Infantry Regiment. And as far as we know, this probably saw a lot of service as in their campaign to Vicksburg. And so once again, that flag staff was being held by those color bearers. And you can imagine through all those miles of marching and battles, you know, there's the blood, the stains, the sweat, the tears, the dirt, all that history is part of that story. And so when you look at each of these flags, they might not have seen a lot of service, but they were, you know, important parts of Minnesota's history and what these, what these men were fighting for. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.